Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's Frontiers seminar. Um, it's my greatest pleasure um, to, uh, to um, introduce Dr. Patty Gans, who's the Distinguished Professor of Medicine at the David Geffen School of Medicine and Professor of Health Policy and Management, um, Jonathan and Karen Fielding School of Public Health at UCL. UCLA, and she's also the Associate Director for Population Sciences at the Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center at UCLA. Um, Dr. Gans is a medical oncologist and has been a member of the UCLA faculty since 1978 and uh, also at the School of Public Health since 1992. She's been the Associate Director for Population Sciences um, at the Cancer Center um, since then, and she was awarded, um, she's had many, many awards, um, and she is the American Cancer Society's Clinical Research Professorship for Enhancing Patient Outcomes Across the Cancer Continuum. Dr. Gans was elected to the Institute of Medicine in 2007, which is now the National Academy of Medicine. She served on the Board of Scientists advisors for the National Cancer Institute, and um, on the, she's been on the board of the American Society of Clinical Oncology from 2003 to 2006. She's received the ACS Medal of Honor in 2010, and from the, she was a Komen Professor of Survivorship Award from 1999 to 2000, as well as a Komen Scholar for uh, more than 10 years. Her research um, is also funded by the Breast Cancer Research Foundation, and she's been on their board since 2012 and received an award from them, the Julie Rose Award. Dr. Gans's uh, research has been um, in survivorship, cancer, breast cancer survivorship, and uh, she has been a leader in this area for many, many, many years. Um, her major areas um, include late effects of cancer treatment treatment, measurement of uh, patient reported outcomes and clinical treatment trials, and the quality of care in cancer patients. Um, since 2017, she has been the editor-in-chief of the JNCI, which is a major um, journal uh, for in our field. And this gives me such great pleasure. Patty and I have known each other for many years through um, through many different organizations through Komen and through other things. And I'm um, really excited to have her today as one of our speakers. So please let's give her a warm welcome and um, we welcome her today to Stanford, but I really wish that it was here in person that we could um, have introduced her to all of you. So thank you. Thanks for that warm introduction. Uh, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Just uh, let me go back a little bit here. Okay. While you're doing that, um, I, we will take questions at the end and you could either put them into the Q&A um, or raise your hand and I can um, call you out and you can just ask it um, in person. Okay. So uh, so it's great to be with you. Uh, it would have been nice to visit your campus, but this is where we are today. Um, and I'm going to be talking about uh, aging and cancer and really the implications for cancer survivors. And this was a talk that I put together maybe two or three years ago, and I actually first gave it to a patient group, not really realizing how kind of overwhelming it might be for them. So it's been refined over time, and hopefully, um, it will be of interest to you uh, to see where we are, in fact, investigating some of the late effects of cancer treatment. So I want to start with a case presentation. Uh, J.H. was a 39-year-old woman referred to me for a survivorship consult by her primary care physician. This was way back in January of 2012. She was married, she had a daughter, and she was working as a teacher. And she had a history of Hodgkin lymphoma stage 2B that had been diagnosed at age 23. She had been treated with uh, ABVD chemotherapy for six cycles and had a cumulative adriamycin dose of 300 milligrams per meter squared. She received only low dose involved field radiation to the mantle field of the chest, and she went into a complete remission with this treatment. 
However, she had an asymptomatic recurrence that was detected on PET scan uh, just a few years later at age 25. And at that time, she was treated with high dose chemotherapy, stem cell rescue, and additional full dose radiation to the chest. I should mention she managed to have a daughter uh, in between those two episodes of treatment. So uh, her other past history at the time I saw her was that of hypertension. She was on medications. She had had premature ovarian failure and was on hormone therapy. This was after the stem cell transplant. She'd had a cholecystectomy in 2006, and she had had a suspicious lesion in her right breast and had had a biopsy. She also had migraine headaches. Other pertinent findings on my review were a lipid panel that was a slightly elevated LDL, her TSH was normal. She had an echocardiogram that showed a marginal inject ejection fraction at 50 to 55%, and there was trace aortic and mitral regurgitation, and she had moderately severe anxiety with white coat hypertension. My consultation recommendations back in 2012 were that she needed late effects monitoring. She had to have cardiac follow-up because of both the radiation and chemotherapy that she had had, the a low ejection fraction uh, that I uh, noted, and I referred her to a cardio-oncologist. Um, in terms of her breast health, um, she needed high-risk screening for breast cancer related to the radiation exposure, and I said perhaps she should discontinue the hormone therapy. For skin health, of course, we know when you have radiation exposure like this, you need to have uh, skin exams because of the increased radiation um, as an etiology for skin cancer. And bone health because of the extensive treatment that she had had with the possibility of bone loss, premature menopause needed to be looked at for a risk of osteoporosis. And then for health promotion and disease prevention, her BMI was slightly elevated. She had an increased LDL. And again, I made a recommendation for considering lifestyle interventions and possibly pharmacologic intervention with a statin. In terms of her psychosocial issues, uh, she had very significant anxiety, and I suggested that she be evaluated for medication by our integrative oncology center and have a uh, counseling referral. Fast forward in 2018, she now comes to see me at age 46, referred by her primary care physician. The interval history, she had now developed thyroid nodules and was on suppressive therapy. She had severe anxiety related to her health condition. In January of 2018, she had new onset of orthopnea and presyncope. An echocardiogram showed significant aortic sclerosis and regurgitation. She had mitral regurgitation and a very low ejection fraction. In March of 2018, she had a breast MRI, which showed a suspicious nodule in the left breast. And in April of 2018, she had a cardiac catheterization that showed severe stenosis of several vessels and very significant aortic insufficiency and a very poor ejection fraction. In June of 2018, she underwent cardiac surgery. She had an aortic valve replacement and two vessel bypass. And in August of 2018, she had a breast biopsy that showed ductal carcinoma in site two. And at that time, finally, her hormones, uh, hormone replacement was discontinued. So some reflections on this case. The patient was only 46 years old and had multiple chronic conditions that I've elaborated upon. She has severe post-traumatic stress symptoms from the cancer treatment that were poorly controlled. She has had excellent co-management by an internist and cardiologist with special interest in oncology and cancer survivors. And she has required major cardiac surgery and has non-invasive breast cancer. And so I ask you, is this the likely health status of an average 46-year-old woman? So what am I going to talk about? Uh, cancer is a disease of aging, and we know that the cancer risk goes up as we age, but aging uh, increases the risk for chronic diseases. Uh, so what is the evidence linking cancer treatments to accelerated aging? And what are the manifestations of accelerated aging in cancer survivors? And finally, what can we do about this? So um, these data from a publication a few years ago in Cancer Epidemiology and Biomarkers 
shows the relentless and positive increase in the number of survivors. And here you can see by 2040, we expect to have 26 million cancer survivors. But the main thing that I wanna point out and which this article did is the large number of individuals, 75 to 84 years of age and over 85 years of age. So we see not only an increase in the number of survivors, but the, an increase in the number of older cancer survivors. And again, the average age of a cancer diagnosis is over age 65. So that with the baby boomers turning 65, 10,000 every day, we are going to have this tsunami of aging and cancer. So what are some of the hallmarks of aging and how do they uh, influence the development of cancer? Um, contributors to the development of cancer include challenges to repair of DNA and including genomic instability, telomere attrition, and epigenetic alterations. And this is important because as I will talk about, many of our cancer treatments also cause these same changes um, that are associated with aging uh, in a normal setting. And again, just to uh, review the incidence of cancer and its mortality, again, in the dark band, you can see here, uh, the incidence peaks up here around age 65, much less frequent in younger ages, and mortality uh, following this. If we look at the estimated number of survivors, as I've already talked about, not only are we going to have increasing numbers, and when I used to show this slide, 2022 was in the future, it's now this year. Um, you can see that we expect about 18 million survivors this year, but I wanna show here with this turquoise band, the very long-term survivors who are expanding. So people more than 15 years after a cancer diagnosis. And this is really the period of time that we see many of the more serious late effects of cancer treatment. Uh, early on, we see uh, other symptoms that are important for survivors, but as people live longer, many years after the treatment exposures, we can expect some important acceleration in terms of aging risk factors. So as I've already mentioned, <clears throat> aging increases the risk for chronic diseases, and I'm not gonna read this list, but these are uh, important for us uh, just because of the societal demographics that we're living in right now. And if we think about what happens with aging and chronic disease, we have both health span and lifespan, which is if you in fact uh, have a normal lifespan and you notice I don't have any years and age and years, um, uh, it may be this period of time, but the number of healthy years and health span may be somewhat shorter. And so there may be a period of time that people are living, but they are not in fact healthy, that they may be living with chronic disease. And this is the difference, this gap between lifespan and health span that we think about when we uh, discuss comorbidity and chronic disease in the aging population. So I want to just speak to the mo uh, in the moment uh, to the, the issue of frailty, which is very important in the field of geriatrics, where in fact, uh, as one becomes more frail, one's needs uh, increase. And this is something like the clinician will look at the patient and say, this person's frail. But there are in fact a number of definitions uh, and components of the diagnosis of frailty that I'll discuss in a minute. But this is a state of increased vulnerability resulting from aging-related decline in reserve and function across multiple systems, and it compromises the individual's ability to cope. And we've certainly seen this um, with the COVID epidemic. Those who are the most frail are the most vulnerable to this particular disease. The frailty phenotype was actually um, defined with some characteristics in the cardiovascular health study, which um, I've cited below. And uh, if we want to look at the components of frailty, this includes weight loss, exhaustion, and really this is the fatigue of feeling that you did, you know, did a whole day's work but really did nothing and you could not get going. And uh, again, if you see older people who are frail, um, they will talk about this even though they rest and, and sleep they don't feel <clears throat> relieved from this. Uh, low physical activity, slowness in a timed walk if you test somebody, and weakness, which can be assessed with grip strength. 
So the pace at which frailty occurs is variable in the normal aging population, but is associated with the accumulation of chronic diseases associated with aging. So it's rare that you see somebody who has this frailty phenotype who doesn't already have a number of comorbid conditions. <clears throat> and this is another way to look at this. If we wanted to look at the population and who was frail and who wasn't, you can see with the gradual onset of weakness, perhaps more slowed activity, and then exhaustion, and then finally weight loss, individuals reach this gray zone of uh, frailty. And again, if we go back and look at this uh, curve that I showed you earlier with lifespan and health span, if we look at this gap, this again, frailty line may be important for us uh, when we look at an individual who is having a decline due to comorbid conditions and then reaches this frailty situation. And again, we'll be talking about this with respect to cancer survivors. So what is the evidence that cancer and its treatments accelerate aging? So this is a study from uh, almost 20 years ago by Robin Yabroff and colleagues looking at the National Health Interview Survey study where they compared cancer survivors in that sample to age-matched individuals who did not have a history of cancer. And of course, we know this is a very um, systematic epidemiological sampling study, and uh, again, using state-of-the-art measures. And if we look at the uh, very standard epi epidemiologic uh, question, how would you rate your health? Excellent, very good, good, fair, poor. We can see that the cancer survivor sample here on the left, 31% rated their health as fair and poor, whereas only 18% of the matched sample who did not have a cancer history reported their health as fair or poor. And again, this was uh, statistically significant. If we look at the number of comorbid conditions uh, in the cancer survivors shown in blue compared to in red, the uh, non-affected individuals, we can see only 40% of the survivors said they had no comorbid conditions, whereas 55% of the uh, matched sample did not have comorbid conditions. And if we look across this uh, sampling, we can see uh, across the board, cancer survivors report significantly more comorbid conditions. And if we look at more serious needs for the sample, uh, activities of daily limit, limit living, um, such as doing your shopping, doing household chores, etc. Um, more significant impairment uh, in the survivors, limitations of any type, and then activities of daily living, toileting, um, grooming, and so forth. Again, much more significant uh, in the cancer survivor sample. And just again, just to list some of the comorbidities that were increased. Uh, again, numbers are significant because of the sample sizes, but uh, joint pains, back and neck problems, fractures, hypertension, lung and breathing problems. So again, you can see the kinds of comorbidities the cancer survivors were reporting that were uh, more frequent. So this is a very nice review if you want to um, kind of see an update of this, which was put out by uh, Jean Mandelblatt and colleagues recently in JAMA Oncology, really looking at a life course framework uh, to look at the interrelationship between aging and cancer. And as again, as we age as a population, the risk of cancer goes up. But as I am trying to um, communicate today with cancer, we also see an increase in risk of aging consequences, and, and that's what we're going to be exploring. Again, this is another uh, very nice uh, graphic or framework. If we think about early life factors that affect everyone, when again, we're very focused these days on the social determinants of health, early life stress, and so forth, again, uh, individuals who may have a better early life uh, experience may have a slowing, slower aging trajectory as shown here in this green curve, and this may be the norm, and then this could be accelerated with people with uh, more difficult early life events. And again, this is how we're all proceeding across our lifespans. But then we begin to have chronic disease and aging on, on uh, aging effects that affect everyone. And then if you happen to get cancer here, there's an additional burden that people experience, and it may vary. Um, based on the kind of aging trajectory uh, the individual is already on, 
but certainly what we know is that cancer does contribute to this in terms of new symptoms and contributing, but it's based on this background of where the patient already is in terms of their health span. So again, going back to the hallmarks of cancer, if we think about cancer treatment, uh, much of what we do in cancer treatment uh, uh, disrupts and causes damage in all of these spheres, which again, may contribute to accelerated aging. And again, I'm not going to uh, go into detail, but these are among the many common late effects that we see from a variety of treatments that can affect any organ in the body. And again, from this same review, you can see uh, telomere attrition may occur with uh, um, a number of treatments and again, seeing frailty, impaired tissue and organ function, and then other premature aging uh, sim uh, symptoms and syndromes, frailty occurring as a result of cellular senescence, and again, a targeted organ changes due to many of these processes that are interfered with and in fact, accelerate aging. A few more things to think about. Um, one out of 500 adults is a cancer a survivor of childhood cancer. So again, that's because of the great successes we've had in treating children with cancer. 15 to 20% of all new cancers will be diagnosed in someone with a past history of cancer. So when we think about the 1.7 million individuals diagnosed each year, 300,000 or more may be people with a past history of cancer. So cancer treatment and cancer itself may be associated with second cancers. And in this uh, particular analysis that was done a few years ago, 18% uh, of incident cancers were second or higher order cancers, with more than 25% being so in older individuals and 11% for younger individuals. And there have been some updated reports uh, showing again the importance of a past cancer history and its treatment with the development of new cancers. So what have we learned uh, in particular from studying childhood and young adult cancers? And in my mind, these are the canaries in the coal mine in the sense that we've now had 30, 40, 50 years to look at the effects of childhood cancer treatments. And uh, these are some data from the Childhood Cancer Survivor Study, which is a long-term epidemiological study that's compared children with a history of cancer who are surviving with their siblings. And just to show here at the upper left-hand corner, um, the cumulative incidence of any comorbid condition in survivors over time compared to their siblings. And you can see, so there's an increase in the number of comorbid conditions. If we look at the number of conditions that individuals who've had cancer get, this is the cumulative number of any condition, but again, second, third, and fourth conditions. And if we look at the siblings over here, a much lower rate. So the treatment for cancer, that's the exposure, has led to an increase in comorbid conditions um, in children who have survived cancer. And if we look at the kind of chronic diseases that childhood cancer survivors have compared to the sibling controls, um, joint replacements, renal failure, stroke, heart attack, congestive heart failure. Again, very detailed um, collection of data of these comorbidities, but similar to the kinds of high level data that I showed you from the National Health Interview Study, where individuals who've been exposed to cancer treatment have this burden. And again, new malignancies, uh, if we look at panel A in the survivor and sibling comparison, uh, cardiac uh, in, in panel B, uh, hearing changes, vision changes. Again, these are subtle, they're not high incidence, but if you have hearing or vision changes as a result of your cancer treatment, you have deficits that we see commonly in aging. And this is from another study. This was done from Kaiser, where they took a matched sample of young adults. And we think about young adults as being 15 to 39 years of age, treated for their cancer. We see the cancer survivors have more cardiovascular disease compared to those without cancer, especially seen here in breast cancer. And if we look at other types of cancer, we also see increases. Um, so again, in young adults, not just childhood cancer survivors, there's a burden of increasing comorbidity, and in this case, cardiovascular disease as a result of past treatments. 
And lastly, I want to uh, talk about a study done at St. Jude's where they looked at the development of frailty in their cohort of long-term survivors uh, that Curie Ness and uh, others have been studying for a number of years where they bring them back into St. Jude's for very extensive testing. And again, here you can see this idea of frailty and premature accelerating, uh, accelerated aging, uh, and whether there's a cancer history uh, involved. And in terms of their assessments, they did all of the same assessments that the cardiovascular health study did in their St. Jude Life group, which are 18 to 50 year old in the blue, and matched controls from the Memphis, Tennessee area who were uh, unaffected by cancer, and then showing what the frailty incidence was in the cardiovascular health study. And in the St. Jude Life cohort on the left, those who were frail were 7.9% of their sample. And this was very similar to what was seen in the cardiovascular health study in their assessment. Whereas if we look at the pre-frail diagnosis, St. Jude sample is higher in terms of pre-frailty and uh, compared to the gray 6.2% in their community comparison sample. So we see that um, this group of individuals studied in a very detailed and sophisticated way are showing symptoms of frailty or are in fact frail at the time of assessment. So what is the, the concern that we have? Well, this again leads to decreased ability to function independently and again, early death. Again, the lifespan for children with a history of cancer is substantially shorter uh, with death occurring 15, 10, 15, 20 years earlier in some exposures. So I want to now talk about something less severe than frailty and death, but chronic symptoms that are associated with frailty that are also common in adult cancer survivors. And um, many of you may know that I've been studying fatigue with my colleague, uh, Julie Bauer, for um, over 20 years now. We've been studying this in great detail, mostly in breast cancer survivors. I've also been um, looking at cognitive difficulties for over 20 years um, because these are certainly um, common problems in breast cancer survivors, but also many other kinds of cancers um, who are in patients who are treated, but it can occur in anyone um, even without uh, a, a substantial exposure to chemotherapy or radiation. And I've listed a few other symptoms that are also important in uh, cancer survivors, which in fact overlap a lot with symptoms that you see in aging. And again, um, they're associated with the frailty phenotype. So I want to talk about cognitive changes as an example and a little bit about this problem. Um, again, this is commonly reported and experienced by patients mostly during treatment, but we also see it persisting after treatment. And you can see a wide range, at least in breast cancer survivors, uh, over many, many years, uh, patients reporting uh, difficulty with thinking and memory. Uh, longitudinal studies show somewhat uh, smaller samples uh, reporting this, but again, individuals many years after their cancer treatment and certainly initiated during the time of treatment um, may experience cognitive problems. And again, it's not just chemotherapy, it's radiation and endocrine therapy. And many studies have now shown that some deficits may just be associated with the cancer itself. Um, and what do patients tell us? What do the survivors say? Well, I'm still able to function, but it's the fine degree of memory or speed at which I'm able to recall information or so when I leave at the end of the day, I'm spent, I'm fatigued. It's mental spent, it's not what I was able to do in the past. And I'm not just as sharp as I was. I used to be able to think on my feet really well and that edge is just totally gone now. So these are common things that if you listen to your patients, you'll hear. And again, as a young oncologist, I remember uh, a Sentinel article uh, that came out of Stanford, which talked about fatigue persisting in Hodgkin survivors 10, 15, 20 years. It was a very wonderful long-term study. So this doesn't go away after the cancer treatment ends, and that part of the mental fatigue is very important for patients who have had cancer treatment. So it's multifactorial in etiology, and things that we know contribute to concentration and and cognitive difficulties are anxiety and depression that can occur in anyone, 
but there are also pre-existing genetic factors such as ApoE4, uh, uh, SNP changes, uh, changes in hormone levels, the toxic effects of chemotherapy. We've spent a lot of time looking at pro-inflammatory cytokines and their effects. And again, another thing that we notice in many of our patients is people who are high functioning, who are multitasking, who may just uh, notice those subtle changes are individuals who all, often will report difficulties with cognitive function. So a number of years ago, uh, after we realized that uh, many kinds of exposures could lead to cognitive function, there was a renaming of this field to cancer and cancer-related cognitive impairment um, so that someone does not have to have had chemotherapy exposure to be complaining or being found to have objective findings related to cognitive difficulties. Now, why is this even something that we would think about that would be associated with or similar to aging? And what we know when we look at patients who have cognitive complaints, we are seeing mostly changes in speed of processing, some uh, working memory problems, some executive function, and long-term memory. So these are the kinds of tests and these are the neurocognitive tests that are uh, performed in batteries frequently. And these are the domains that we see most in aging. So you can see this age-related decline in these domains. And these are most commonly affected in cancer-related cognitive impairment. So there's a sense that there's some overlap with normal aging in terms of the difficulties that cancer patients report in terms of cognition. And again, if we think about it, there's some common mechanisms for cognitive decline. Uh, we know that in aging, inflammation increases, there can be white matter changes, and there's reduced neural efficiency. And similarly, we are pro proposing that some of these same things are occurring in the setting of cancer. And uh, there have been a number of studies that show that there's um, a change in white matter integrity post-chemotherapy uh, in cancer patients. And here I've cited data uh, related to breast cancer patients. Um, but again, this is associated with inflammation as people age and as part of the aging uh, cognitive decline, not Alzheimer's dementia, but the normal cognitive decline that we see with aging. So what are the consequences? And again, me, many uh, people who look at older adults and test them in terms of evaluation, and uh, certainly in terms of tests that have been done either with fMRI or PET scan, we see that during a memory task in an older individual, they will often get the answer to the task um, that, that is being studied in the scanner, but it takes more brain activation for that to happen. And we see a similar effect in cancer survivors post-treatment. And I'm going to show you this now classic picture of a twin who had chemotherapy exposure for breast cancer and her sister who had had no chemotherapy and these were identical uh, twins who were subjected to a, an NBAC test in an FM, fMRI scan. And again, when we look at the two uh, individuals comparing the brain activation for the first uh, test in the NBAC, um, the patient who had been exposed to both chemotherapy and tamoxifen had to call in more of the frontal areas of the brain to get the response where we see only very limited activity in the frontal cortex uh, for the sister. And again, for the second uh, NBAC test, again, more activation here in the posterior aspects of the brain. Here, the sister who was unexposed had to call in the frontal areas of the brain. And then here you see in the final task, much more activation. And they both got the answers right, but there's more activation in the individual exposed to chemotherapy and tamoxifen. And in a study that we done with, had done with PET scan activation of a memory task in uh, longer term survivors, uh, you can see uh, that in the scanner, uh, the frontal areas had to be activated for a, a correct answer on the task here in the chemotherapy exposed patients compared to those who had not had chemotherapy. And again, across the board in a lot of the imaging studies have, that have been done, we see the same areas of the brain being activated. So again, um, very important for us to realize that people who have had these kinds of exposures and have complaints of cognitive difficulties are really telling us that their brain is working harder to get the 
answer or do the task at hand in their everyday activities. So if we look at these uh, common mechanisms, um, we would posit that many of the changes that we see in cognitive complaints in cancer survivors are due to reduced neural efficiency, very similar to what we might see in aging. Turning to another topic, uh, and this relates to neuropathy, uh, Carrie Winter Stone uh, at uh, Oregon Health Sciences had an intervention study where she was doing rehabilitation in patients who had difficulty um, after uh, cancer, and she looked at them and studied them in with a lot of laboratory evaluation, and she retrospectively went back to look at those who had reported difficulties with neuropathy and compared their performance with those who had not had uh, exposure to um, drugs that caused neuropathy. These were breast cancer survivors. And what you could see is that patients who reported the severity of their neuropathy as a little to very much on a single item questionnaire, in terms of their physical performance in the laboratory, we see a poorer physical performance in those who reported greater neuropathy after their chemotherapy exposure. Those who had, um, again, more severe neuropathy had more mobility disability, and they had a greater likelihood of falls. So again, a long-term and late effect of treatments. And as we use drugs such as the taxanes, particularly in breast cancer treatment, but other diseases, or platinum uh, in patients with colon cancer, uh, we can see neuropathy persisting for many, many years after the cancer treatment and the risk of falls and mobility problems increase. And uh, another example of a study where this has been looked at came from um, Ohio State, Catherine Alfano and Janice Kiekel Glazer, where they did a prospective observational study of women who were coming in with a breast abnormality, some of them who were diagnosed had breast cancer, but then they followed both the women with breast cancer and those without um, to doing testing on them before the cancer workup and then six months after completion of cancer treatment and then 12 months later and they looked at comorbidity pain and, and inflammation uh, uh, in both groups of patients of individuals and looked at the trajectories for women within and without uh, cancer and if we look at the accumulation of comorbidities with the charleston Com comorbidity index we can see in gold here the cancer patients increasing in com comorbidity after their treatments. This is a year after treatment. If we look at pain as reported on the SF36 pain scale, um, the control group um, stays here in, in blue, but a lower score here means more pain reported um, by the cancer patients. If we look at the comorbidities in relationship to treatments, we see that those who have chemotherapy uh, and radiation are more likely to have a greater comorbidities. And if we look at pain, we see with intensity of treatment, um, greater pain here with chemo and surgery. And this is radiation and surgery and chemotherapy here in gray. So some inference that the intensity of treatment may be associated with the increases in both pain and comorbidities. And then in, um, laboratory cell stimulated inflammatory uh, testing uh, we see that with the cancer patients we see an increase in tnf alpha with their treatment exposure and that persists out to a year after treatment ends same thing with il6 and il1 beta and the total cytokine score again uh, with the controlled comparison an increase in cytokines over time in patients treated with uh, various treatments for breast cancer, again, uh, showing that inflammation is increasing as a result of the exposure to cancer treatment. And in a study that we did in terms of looking at long-term survivors related to DNA damage, um, this is a cohort we've been following for a number of years. These patients uh, were three to six years out after their cancer treatment. Uh, those who had had surgery alone had very minimal DNA damage in um, their cells, but those who had chemotherapy and or radiation showed an increase in DNA damage. And we showed an association between TNF uh, receptor 2 um, with the DNA damage being in the DNA individuals who had higher DNA damage 
who showed a greater likelihood of uh, TNF elevations. And again, looking at cognitive performance uh, in these same patients, those who had high DNA damage compared to the low DNA damage group were more likely to have um, executive function and memory changes. Again, suggesting a relationship between the intensity of treatment and its damage, cellular damage, so the hallmarks of aging that I described earlier, being associated with some of these long-term changes in cognitive function. So moving now to kind of sum up and, and think about where are we uh, in terms of looking at cancer and its treatments and accelerated aging. Um, this is a review that my colleagues and I just recently published, which uh, really summarizes our thinking about this. If we think about cancer and its therapy, um, there are many exposures to treatments which can vary, but these can all lead to cellular stress and damage and the changes that I've talked about as being part of the hallmarks of aging, but then leading to senescent cells, which then accumulate and then lead to inflammation. But there are some biobehavioral modifiers. Again, these are some of the social determinants and other factors that I mentioned earlier, which may in fact make things worse for patients or may be somewhat protective. So again, lifestyle factors such as smoking and inactivity, psychological stress and so forth. So this is the whole person, the host factors that I like to talk about. But then here on the right, these are some of the physical effects that we've been talking about that we think about as being associated with frailty, the increased comorbidity, but then some of the um, neurocognitive and behavioral factors, which may be the results of neuroinflammation from both the cancer and its treatment and the um, risk factors, the host factors that the patient brings to their cancer diagnosis. Then if we wanna think about how we might intervene, we've proposed in this particular review that thinking about interventions that may decrease stress, increase better health with sleep, increase physical activity and better energy balance may all lead to a decrease in inflammation and some of these factors that we know are accelerating aging. So thinking about behavioral interventions that could be applied to prevent biological aging overall in the population, but in survivors certainly. And even in the setting of cancer and its treatment, we can be thinking about these interventions to be potentially helpful in mitigating the effects of cancer treatment. And that's one of the things that we would like to be thinking about in terms of testing in the future doing interventions that may in fact protect individuals from this accelerated aging. And perhaps in the future, we'll have pharmacological interventions that may be protective for patients who are going through cancer treatments. So what can be done? What's really practical? And again, uh, that model that I just showed you was hypothetical, but things that we can definitely do with our survivors are to point out things that are health promoting Again, all of the things that we know are uh, important as part of our prevention armamentarian in terms of avoiding tobacco, alcohol, alcohol and preventing weight gain uh, and enhanced physical activity, which may be good for many aspects of recovery after cancer treatment, but brain health as well. And maintaining bone health as well uh, because of the risks for falls and fractures that may occur as a result of the neuropathy that patients may have. Um, managing these symptoms can be very important. And again, uh, there are things that we can do for all of the things that I've listed that are both pharmacologic and behavioral. And what we've found, and many others have as well, is that many mind-body techniques are often very helpful in terms of managing these symptoms. Disease prevention and surveillance. I, I talked to you about the second cancers that are so common in the cancer survivor population, but the cardiovascular risk factors that lead to substantial morbidity in the example of the case that I presented. And cancer screening for recurrence of cancer is very important, as well as genetic testing for hereditary risks, which again, even in this day and age, are off, is not often done as well as it should be for individuals who may in fact have a hereditary risk of cancer. So these are really the key elements of survivorship care, palliation, prevention, and health promotion, and are something that we need to pay attention to when we're dealing 
with it, preventing both accelerated aging and improving the quality of life and survivorship for our patients with cancer. So if we want to think about that health span and lifespan curve and kind of as a figure summarizing what I've talked about, multimodal cancer treatment is exposing the patient to risks for uh, increased comorbidity and moving them down to that, that curve where they've lost some of their health. And this gap is something that patients face, but perhaps with exercise, diet, prevention, and surveillance, the things that I just mentioned, we can in fact narrow that gap and have a better quality survivorship and reduce the risks associated with cancer and aging. So thank you very much for your attention and I will stop sharing my screen and uh, join you. Patty, that was an excellent um, presentation and you really covered the whole gamut. And, you know, my question, I think you got to that towards the end of your talk and it's probably where we all want to get to is, you know, some way to prevent some of the toxicities and the, um, you know, some of the real problems that these patients have with, you know, the, I guess the toxicities, the chemo brain and ways that we might be able to think of um, ways to reducing many of those um, um, complications that they have post-treatment. And, you know, I'm not sure. I know that there, <clears throat> excuse me, that there are some trials and other things, but where do you think that that's going to go in terms of um, the future? So um, I think, you know, up until now, at least in adult cancer, we've just thought about curing patients. We are in a very exciting period in cancer treatment where we're doing more dis de escalation. And that mm -hmm. is um, something very exciting. Uh, you know, in breast cancer, where I work mostly clinically, uh, we are trying to really be very specialized in who gets chemotherapy. So we have all those genomic classifiers that are very helpful, but we're de escalating radiation therapy. And at least in our hands, it, it is chemotherapy that's important, but also radiation. That is kind of the gift that keeps on giving. The tissues keep changing over many, many years, mm -hmm. ongoing inflammation. And I think the pediatricians have learned also that if they can omit the radiation. So I would say on one end, we need to basically not have a one size all cancer treatment program for patients. Um, and then early on to recognize when patients are complaining of these things, um, most of the studies that we've done with patients after treatment, they've mentioned things to their doctors and nobody paid any attention. You know, you should just be happy to be alive. And mm -hmm. if you think about the transplant population that I always think about them as having had an atomic bomb that went off, you know, and the transplant docs will often say, well, you know, you had a transplant, <laughs> but, you know, we need to be intervening much earlier on these symptoms. Um, to be able to give patients a chance to have that inflammation modified. And we do know with a lot of the studies we've done with yoga, with mindfulness, uh, with Tai Chi, and I'm just mentioning a few that we've done in our group, we see a drop in inflammation with these interventions. Patients feel better, um, their sleep is better, their fatigue is better. Um, with mindfulness, we just did a study in younger women their depression uh, dropped and we saw improvements in fatigue and insomnia uh, with the mindfulness, uh, as well as inflammatory markers that moved with this. So I think uh, doing anything we can mm -hmm. early on to try and mitigate those symptoms is very important. So there's a question from the audience from um, Renak um, um, Trivedi. And um, can I call on um, her to to um, ask this question live? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bondi, and thank you, Dr. Gans, for a really fascinating presentation. Um, my question is, a, a lot of my work has been in cardiovascular disease. I'm new to the uh, field of cancer, and I'm a clinical health psychologist, and a lot of the risk factors you mentioned, a lot of the findings in general you mentioned towards the end, track to what we've already learned from decades of cardiovascular disease research and other chronic conditions. So it seems to me that we collectively in different specialties have made a really strong case that we should have people with 
have clinical health psychology expertise or a psycho-oncologist or subspecialties, that should be standard practice and not some, but not just when people are spiraling, as you mentioned in your case study, where somebody was really overwhelmed with anxiety and PTSD, but really as a primary secondary prevention. What are some barriers you see in terms of standing programs like those up within medical centers? And what can we as a community do to make the hospital leadership and other uh, folks who kind of decide the system um, remove those barriers and make the case that this is an important part of clinical care and it's not a luxury item, but rather should be integrated within standard cancer care. So you're, you're speaking to somebody who couldn't be happier to have that question. Uh, you know, in the fee-for-service environment where every little piece of activity that's done with the patient is billed for, uh, psychologists are not easily integrated into the care. Mm -hmm. And it's only in most places that have psychologists or social workers um, involved immediately co-managing patients in the clinic mm -hmm. is where there's bundled payment or um, there's philanthropic money that's supporting that service. And it needs to be, uh, behavioral health needs to be part and parcel of medical care. Mm -hmm. And I see this happening in the adolescent medical practices and primary care where there's a lot of um, interest in uh, medical adolescent care where mm -hmm. substance abuse and um, behavioral problems may be arising. And so psychologists are just placed in those practices because that is good medical care delivery for that population. But you're absolutely right. <clears throat> until we do population health and until the care for the patient is not piecemeal paid by billing for one service or another, mm -hmm. this is not going to happen. I hope in my lifetime this will happen, but um, population health and population health care delivery in the clinic needs to be multidisciplinary team care. I, I couldn't agree with you more. You cannot treat the body without the mind and vice versa. So Thank you so much. That was an excellent question. And I think that, I, and I think that it comprehends, I worked at MD Anderson for many years and, you know, the comprehensiveness of a cancer center, I think that that was the whole idea was to try to bring that together um, for patients. And, you know, that was the, you know, one of the main ideas of, um, of trying to to have comprehensiveness, but it doesn't always work in most other settings. Um, I'm going to call on Dr. Spiegel. He has a question um, as well. Um, can we bring David in live? Thanks, David. Sure. Nice to see you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sure. Gantz, for an excellent and comprehensive presentation. Uh, and I'm very glad to hear you talk about the studies you're doing on mind-body interventions. And uh, you're absolutely right that they can have a tremendous effect without pathologizing the patient, but teaching them to better master their mind-body relationship. You mentioned PTSD in your initial case, and your comments, uh, particularly toward the end, suggest that there are elements of treatment and disease progression that justifiably induce fear. So the, a lot of the symptoms of PTSD, intrusive thoughts, hyperarousal, negative expectations about the future are not so irrational. And as you point out, are often ignored. You know, I'm very interested to hear what you say about radiation therapy. It's like what we're learning about surgery too, that uh, too much is not a good thing often. So how can we programmatically acknowledge the rationality of these fears and incorporate them into both uh, restraint and treatment, but also offer more comprehensive psychosocial treatment? Again, you know, you, you've done an amazing job with what you've done as well. I think the problem is that, you know, medical care and mental health care are siloed. And uh, yeah. if I speak it, I recall I was at a quality of care meeting a few years ago that ASCO had where um, clinicians were saying, oh, you know, we, you know, anything that they didn't know how to give a pill for something, they could give a pill for insomnia, but they didn't know about behavioral strategies or the same mm -hmm. thing for fatigue. I don't ask about fatigue because I don't have a treatment for it. You know, they didn't used to ask about sexuality or infertility either until we pushed them on this. So I, I think we need to have the Venn diagram overlap between what behavioral science clinical interventions can do and what clinical medicine can do. And I think that recognizing the kind of stresses that patients have, again, um, in my most recent work with young women with depression, I am just so passionate about this. 
you know, we need to be doing depression screening in absolutely every cancer patient. Yeah. Uh, if we are not, we are not providing good quality care. And if a U.S. Preventive Services Task Force gives this a B and primary care should be doing it, we need to be doing it for every patient with cancer because not only will you find the anhedonias, but you'll find the suicidal patient who we don't know. The big problem is how do we then make the mental health care just easily available? And I think that's your side of the, you know, the divide there too, is you know, how do we make those clinicians accessible? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'd like to call on uh, Dr. Shapira. She has a question that she put in the chat room. And oh, um, thanks. Thanks, Lydia. Hi, Patty. That was a phenomenal presentation. Thank you so much. I just want to pick on the other siloed part of the care for long-term um, cancer survivors, and that's primary care. Um, health outcomes will be determined also by access to primary care. And we know from many studies that the primary care force is unprepared um, to care for cancer survivors and that we don't have enough models for co-management and access to good primary care. Can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that um, and where the oncology and primary care clinicians should join forces to um, improve health outcomes for long-term survivors? Sure, and I, I know about the work that you're trying to do, which I think is very, very important because most of those older adults who I showed you are going to be part of that tsunami. They're all being cared for by primary care doctors, but once the cancer occurs, we swoop them up into the cancer care system and it's hard to get them back. So I, I you know, uh, the things that I think EPIC has helped us with or whatever system, I know, I know you have EPIC, is that the primary care doctor is at least listed when we see them as a cancer patient and we can send them notes, but many, many years ago, we didn't even know, we didn't ask, or I did, but other people didn't. Who was the primary care? How do, how do we keep them in the loop where we're, while we're treating the patient? And how do we make them less fearful? How do we deal with their psyche? How do we deal with their overwhelm when they see a patient like I presented? I was very lucky actually that case presentation came from a grand rounds that I did at UCLA where I actually had the internist and the uncle cardiologist up there with me discussing the case just to show how important this is. So I think we need to find those internal medicine or primary care champions. Uh, there are a few scattered around the country, but this needs to be part of their um, group of patients, just like they're going to take care of people with chronic diabetes or um, stroke, things like this, they need to know and be comfortable and not be fearful. And we need to basically advocate for the patient, but the patients need to be able to feel comfortable. That's the other side of the story. They get very attached to their oncologist. They feel insecure because the primary care doctor didn't make their diagnosis, whatever it was. So we need to demystify and improve um, communication about the value of primary care. But there need to be enough primary care physicians. And I know in a lot of parts of the country, um, that's one of the things I hear is that they can't even find a primary care doctor to refer the patient to. So there are lots of healthcare system problems, as well as the interprofessional challenges that we face. Thank you so much. We're at the, just at the hour and it went so fast because this was an, such an engaging um, presentation. And next time, Patty, we will have you here at Stanford because we'd love to host you here and pick your brain on so many different things and also build more collaborations with you. Um, so on that note, I would like to, um, again, thank you for your time and being here with us. And um, wish you well on your trip to Egypt. And I'm gonna put you in touch with uh, Dr. Gruber. I did um, text her and she said she'd be happy to talk to you. Okay. So uh, enjoy your trip and stay safe everybody and see you at the next, um, um, next SCI Frontiers meeting. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for uh, letting me uh, share my thoughts with you. Oh, always Patty, thank you. <laughs>